With the rise of digital color grading in the early 2000s, arguably no film genre was more affected than horror. With the capabilities now at filmmakers' fingertips to reshade an entire picture from the editing room, film after film began to take on a familiar, washed-out, blue-green aesthetic. This, of course, moved on, as all film trends do, but while I've seen plenty of people online identifying this digital grading technique as the de facto horror film look of the 2000s, I see one film too often lumped in with the rest. Arguably responsible for creating the look in the first place is 2002's The Ring, the Gore Verbinski-directed American remake of the 1998 Japanese film Ringu. After the film's sleeper success, the look exploded into the mainstream, digitally mimicked across dozens of Hollywood horror films for years, though never quite with the same depth and unique character. That's because The Ring went through an entirely different process than any of those films, creating its look almost entirely in-camera. Once I'd found that out, I couldn't help myself, and this became yet another deep dive, trying to figure out not just how they put the look together back then, but what it would take for me to replicate it. To my surprise, figuring out exactly how the ring was shot proved to be a challenge all on its own. Considering the film's influence, it's remarkably hard to find any information about the production. However, by luck, I caught wind of an old American cinematographer interview about The Ring's production with Bojan Bazelli, the film cinematographer. Unlike other AC articles I've cited in previous videos though, this one was a lot harder to access, as it had been published exclusively in print over 20 years ago, and as far as I could tell, never digitized. I was in a tough spot, supposedly this article held all the information I needed, but no matter how hard I looked, I couldn't find a scan, a photo, or even a transcription of it anywhere online. So, I went back to the source. The article itself, which I've scanned and linked in an album below so you can reference it easier than I could, goes into satisfying detail about all the work that brought the film's look to life. What's astounding as you go through it is just how much effort the filmmakers went through to get as much as possible in camera. For example, rather than green screen city exteriors outside the in-studio apartment set, a 270-degree wraparound illuminated background was created from high-resolution photographs. They even went so far as to custom make radically different versions of the haunted tape to make sure that not only could the actors watch it in its entirety during the scenes themselves, we could actually see it and its contents reflected in their faces. As you might expect, all this effort extended to the film's cinematography, where an extraordinary amount of effort was made to create the film's signature, eerie, green-soaked look entirely in camera, using a series of surprisingly simple yet effective tools. Starting from the outside in, the first things the film's cold, soft light went through were a key part of creating the film's unique look in camera. Filters. Even in the modern age, where almost all color work beyond lighting comes from post-production color grading, filters haven't gone away by any means. Some form of filtration is used on almost every major film set, from neutral density filters to limit light coming into the camera, to diffusion filters to soften harsh, high-resolution digital sensors. However, prior to the development and adoption of digital color correction, one of the primary ways cinematographers adjusted the look and the colors of a film, aside from post-production color timing, was through the use of color filters. This could be as simple as an orange filter to correct bluish daylight for a tungsten-balanced film stock, or as complex as the rich tapestry of filters Christopher Doyle stacked in front of the lens for Days of Being Wild, each transforming the light that reaches the film stock and baking in these visual choices before it ever hits the editing bay. To a lot of us now, used to the flexibility of raw and log files in modern cinema cameras, giving up so much control of the image like this can feel limiting. But even into the early days of digital color grading, using filters remained a reliable and often more natural method of crafting a distinct look for a film beyond a heavy-handed digital color wash. To achieve its eerie, muted color palette, the ring was primarily filmed with two types of filters, usually stacked on top of each other. The first was an 81EF filter, a very mild warming filter that allowed Bizelli to slightly correct the tungsten-balanced film stock for the daylight shooting conditions, while still maintaining a cold color palette in the cloudy exteriors. For some perspective, the 81EF filter is a color temperature correction of a measly 650 Kelvin, only a fraction of the standard 2300 Kelvin adjustment of an 85B filter, which is used to fully correct daylight for tungsten-balanced films. 
As a side note to avoid the inevitable confusion in the comment section, in the American Cinematographer article I used as reference, the 81EF filter is erroneously listed as an 85EF, which, as far as I can tell, does not exist. The only warming filter listed in every source I consulted with an EF suffix appears to be the 81EF that the film was shot on. The second of the two types was actually a pair of green filters, a full-strength version off-the-shelf from Tiffin, and a half-strength version custom-made for the production by optical engineering house Harrison & Harrison. According to Bazzelli, the full-strength filter, referred to as Green 1 on the set, was equal to about plus 14 points of green printer lights in a traditional color timing bay, which measures the exposure of blue, red, and green light on a 1 to 50 scale, each point equaling roughly 1 12th an f-stop in exposure. The custom filter, on the other hand, referred to as Green Half, was accordingly only plus 7 points of green. While Green 1 was used for most of the film, Green Half was extensively used for close-ups on the actors. The danger of using too much green on the actors' faces, Bazzelli said, was that if we had to time out the green, we'd be adding magenta, which would adversely affect other parts of the shot. It was a very delicate balance to maintain the right look without going too far. Moving past the filters, Bazzelli primarily shot using Cook S4 lenses at low apertures, usually around T2.5, to compensate for the reduction of light from the heavy filtration, and supplemented with high-speed Zeiss superspeed lenses and an ingenue zoom as called for. Bazzelli favored medium-length lenses throughout the production to represent the main character's naturalistic point of view, noting that the 32, 40, and 50mm lenses were common picks. Between the lighting and the filters, the look of the film already leaned cold and softly lit, with a heavy green tinge on top of everything. But to make sure the tones he was going for were accurately captured, Bazzelli carefully chose his film stock for the production, selecting and exclusively using an aging variant of Kodak EXR 200T, which had been introduced in 1992 and would be retired only two years after the release of the film. The T in 200T stands for tungsten, the color temperature the film is balanced to, and in this case, around 3200 Kelvin. While these kinds of films look normal under warm indoor and other artificially lit environments, the blue cast tungsten balanced film takes on in daylight was perfect for the cold tones of the film. Though the first generation of Codex Vision series, whose successors would later subsume Codex's entirety of color movie film offerings, was widely available at the point of filming, Bazzelli preferred the finer grained EXR film, for its creamy tones and ability to hold highlights better than the newer stocks, something that was critical to hold details in the skies in the wide latitude exteriors of the film. The distinctive appeal of the 5293 variant of EXR 200T would continue far after its retirement, with cinematographer Lawrence Scher and colorist Jill Bogdanovich going so far as to work with a veteran Kodak color scientist to recreate the look of the stock for the 2019 Todd Phillips film Joker. Between the cold blue daylight on tungsten film and extensive filtration, Bazzelli worried the planned pale color palette of grays, blues, and greens could end up compromised. After testing a series of low contrast stocks, which lent poorly to the extremely soft lighting they intended to use, he returned to his chosen Kodak EXR stock, instead using a classic but somewhat rarely used development technique to mold it into exactly what he was looking for. During shooting, Bazzelli slightly overexposed the negative, rating it at 160 ASA, about a third of a stop under the 200 ASA box speed. Then, he had the film pull processed by a whole stop during development, giving him a final image underexposed by two-thirds of a stop, along with a number of other effects. While the much more common technique of push processing overdevelops a negative, increasing its sensitivity and effectively increasing its apparent exposure, contrast, and grain, pole processing by contrast underdevelops with exactly the opposite effects. Bazzelli found that pulling the EXR stock not only lowered its exposure, but it softened the film's tones even more, and critically offered reduced contrast and less saturated colors, which was, to quote Bazzelli, exactly what we wanted. I wasn't able to find any notes from Bazzelli referencing the color timing the film went through, which led me to believe it was probably minimal, the standard contrast adjustments and mild color corrections that any other film of that era would have gone through, as suggested by Bazzelli's concerns when it came to choosing a filter for the film's close-ups. Big color shifts weren't needed at this point anyway, the filters were doing that job for them. Laying it all out like this, it was surprisingly a lot simpler than I expected for a film with this rich of a look just filters, development tricks, soft light, and the right choice of film stock. 
It was easy enough for me to grasp the fundamentals, but putting them into practice to remake the look myself, let alone on a pretty thin budget, was going to be another thing altogether. The first issue I ran into, and the one most likely to stump other people trying to replicate the same process, was getting a hold of a green filter that matches the one in the film. The American Cinematographer article refers to the filter as primary green, but the first search results for primary green filter only point to the extremely strong type of green filter used to lighten and even out greens in an image when shooting black and white film. Any color images I saw made using one of these filters was so aggressively green that I knew immediately I needed to keep searching. During some of my initial experiments using a digital camera and lighting gels I had on hand, I'd had a surprising amount of luck using a simple Roscoe straw gel shot at a cold color temperature, but this was far from the setup described in the article. With a little digging though, I found the likely culprit in a series of green color compensation filters. While these seemed to be primarily marketed towards countering overly magenta artificial lighting, it seemed to be by far the closest offering among the very limited collection of plus green filters available, so I set my sights on them for the initial tests. The only problem was, getting a hold of any of these filters, especially from Tiffin as referenced in the article, would put a major dent in anyone's pocketbook. Or still, the only availability for these traditional glass filters were either in obscenely large and expensive circular filters, or 4-inch square filters built almost exclusively for cine matte boxes. There were other cheaper polyester filters, but they had to be special ordered and could take up to a month to get to me. However, before despair could set in, another option presented itself. Back in the day, Kodak sold a veritable library of affordable gelatin filters, Feeling similar in the hand as a slightly thick lighting gel, these 3x3-inch filters covered the gamut of filtration, built to be easy to slide into filter holders or printing machines while still being cheap enough to be disposable and easily replaceable once they had taken enough of a beating. Luckily, due to their massive levels of production back in the day, they're available all over eBay for under $10 a piece, low enough for me to be able to buy several for my experiment, and built well enough to deal with the workout I was about to give them. I started by purchasing a pair of green filters, the first a CC30G filter, CC standing for color compensation, 30 referring to its color density, and G for green. I dug long and hard trying to find something that exactly lined up with the green one filter described in the article, but the filter factor system used to denote the Kodak filter's strength didn't seem to have any easy to discern equivalency with the color timing printer point system. Despite this, a 30 density appeared to be one of the standard densities for color correction filters like this, right in the middle of the range and seemingly one of the most popular, so I took a chance on it. In the worst case scenario, I figured, if the negatives came back wrong, I could easily spend another 7 bucks to get something a lot stronger or a lot weaker. To cover my bases though, I also picked up the closest thing I could find to half the strength of the CC30G, a CC20G filter. While I wasn't terribly interested in recreating the green half look described in the article, if the CC30G came back too strong for any reason, it gave me a comfortable backup to lean on. Fortunately, not long after, I also found an 81EF in the same collection of Kodak gelatin filters, and added that to my cart as well. Without any easily available 3x3-inch holders to mount these filters to my lenses, I turned to a DIY solution. Cutting out sheets of cardboard into 3x3 three three squares, I measured and cut out circles that could snugly fit around the front element of each one of my lenses. These were not only basically free, it made it easy for me to quickly tape on whatever filters I needed in the field, and just slide them on, making lens swapping painless. With my filters in place, the next step was finding the right film stock. Since YouTube doesn't pay me nearly enough to shoot my tests on an actual movie film camera, I opted for using a stills camera instead. Nowadays, motion picture film stocks spooled for still shooting are easily available online from companies like Cinestill, however, the film stock I was looking for was a lot more niche. So I turned to the vast market of independent eBay sellers, bulk loading cans of old film into individual cases and selling them for a fraction of the price of any Cinestill film. This is where my only adjustment to the pipeline came in. While I was able to find someone selling respooled EXR 200T, the nearly 25-year-old film stock was almost certainly expired. While a lot of people enjoy the gamble of shooting expired film, I just couldn't take the chance of color shifts and other issues for such a color-dependent project. Fortunately, Kodak Vision 3 stocks, the third generation and newest successor to EXR, were also available online in 200T. While elements of Kodak's film stocks have changed over time, one of the largest has been the increasingly lower contrast of every Vision generation to aid in the digital intermediate color grading. 
While I knew I was going to be missing out on a few of those specific characteristics Bazzelli noted in the EXR, it was as close as I was going to get without the film stock being expired. The only thing I would need to remember was to add some contrast in post to compensate for the Vision 3's wider latitude. However, there's a reason why people aren't buying up these dirt cheap rolls of cinema film in droves, and that's because of a thing called Remjet. Remjet is a black carbon coating on the back of motion picture film stock protecting it from scratches and static as it moves through the movie camera, as well as preventing halation. During the standard ECN2 development process for movie film stock, the removal of Remjet is a critical step. If it's ignored and developed like traditional stills film, at best it can contaminate the chemistry, and at worst create a buildup of black carbon gunk that can clog developing machines and become a cleanup nightmare. The reason companies like Cinestill are able to comfortably sell and develop their films nearly everywhere, despite being effectively the same Kodak Vision 3 stock, is because during the manufacturing, the step where Remjet is added is skipped. This comes at a cost, though. The lack of Remjet coating on Cinestill films makes them susceptible to characteristic halation effects, something I needed to avoid or risk biasing my results, making them unfit for my tests even if they did carry a 200T film. ECN2 development is a sensitive and specialized process, and as a result, there are only a handful of stills labs in the US offering true ECN2 development. However, this is where I got lucky. Rather than having to ship my film across the country, one of these labs happened to be located in Chicago, not terribly far from where I live, which made this step of the process easily accessible to me. Over the course of a couple weeks, I shot six rolls of film, covering, like the movie, a mix of urban and forested rural locations, and shooting under heavily overcast skies, rating the 200 speed stock at 160. While renting and adapting a series of Cook lenses was far outside my budget range, when possible I shot with contact Zeiss lenses, one of the closest cousins to the Zeiss super speeds that were occasionally used, keeping my aperture low, around f2.8. Aiming to try to match the look of the full strength green one filter, I shot with a number of filter combinations to see which ended up looking closest to the film once I got them back. Keeping the explicitly noted 81EF filter on the whole time, I combined it first with a standard CC30G filter, then the lighter CC20G, as well as stacking the two on top of each other in case I'd undershot the filter strength. I even took a few shots using that straw filter I'd had so much luck using on my digital camera to see how well it held up on film. As a final touch, when I took my rolls in to be developed, I requested the film be pulled one stop to make sure I hit every step of the process before sitting back and anxiously waiting for the results. Upon getting the film back, I was surprised to see that rather than the spotless negatives I was used to receiving, nearly all the rolls were streaked with a thin chemical residue across their backs. This resulted in the first test scans from my lab coming back basically unusable, fogged with strangely shaped markings and looking like something had dried on them. While my first assumption was careless development, with a little research I found this issue was more common than I expected. Let's go back to Remjet for a minute. If you're not purpose-built for movie film development, Remjet is a lot of work to get rid of. Even after a chemical wash to break the remjet down, rinsing it off with water, and even wiping the film down by hand, the results can still be unpredictable. One online lab offering ECN2 development even explicitly warned of this, saying in bright red lettering that the developed film may show imperfections such as residual remjet spots, scratches, and or streaks from drying, which was pretty much exactly what I was dealing with. However, the residue came off easily with a bit of 99% isopropyl alcohol and a microfiber cloth and judging by the dark color of what I was wiping off, I'm almost certain it was the last bits of Remjet clinging to the film, easily missed by the lab as it only showed itself once I'd held the film up closely to a light. But despite the negative scanning in very well at home after a little elbow grease, there were a few things that I couldn't fix. Aside from a number of small scratches attained from all the handling the film had gone through, there were marks that just wouldn't come out, where the Remjet had stuck and scarred the film. Now, I know this isn't gonna be the same for everyone across the board, I've seen enough videos out there of people showing off their beautiful, clean, flawless ECN2 negatives to know that there's at least someone out there getting it right, but let's be honest, that's probably not the norm. Even in a cursory search online, I found enough people bemoaning working with the ECN2 process, particularly when it came to the manual remjet removal, that I know I can't have been the only one struggling with results like these. I'm not saying it's impossible to have it done right or to get consistent results, but I feel like it's only right to lay out clearly what you're getting yourself into if you go that route. But after all this, I'd finally been able to scan in my now clean negatives and see just how successful my experiment had been. 
As you might expect, following Bazelli's instructions paid off. The 81EF filter, combined with the standard CC30G, seemed to make everything look exactly as it should in almost every situation. Despite the heavy filtration, I was impressed by the surprising amount of detail and tonal subtlety they had, as well as how little digital tweaking I had to do to them, contrast aside. On some of the images, a few color temperature adjustments were needed to correct for the scanner's auto colors, but that's about all they took. Comparing my results to a series of screen caps from the ring, I was astonished at just how close they'd ended up, with minimal effort or editing on the back end. When it came to the other variants, however, the CC20G was too mild on its own, and when it was stacked on top of the CC30G, the effect, while interesting, was far too strong. The straw filter, on the other hand, was a totally different beast. Despite coming back on the negative with an extremely strong color shift, I found that, similar to my digital tests, if I cranked the color temperature all the way into the blue range and added a bit of magenta, I was able to get a remarkably close look as well, but these images seemed to lack the nuanced tones and detail present in the other setup, especially in the highlights, which often just became washed in bright green. Across the board though, the final results of my tests were even better than I expected, but getting to that point came with more than its fair share of headaches. If you're comfortable dealing with all that, or like some are confident ECN2 developers at home already, it'll definitely work. But for everyone else, I've taken what I've learned and come up with some friendlier, but still effective alternatives for anyone who wants to try this look at home. If you're planning on shooting on film, it's going to be pretty straightforward. We're mostly going to follow exactly what I did, with a few small changes to adapt this recipe to other kinds of films. Regardless of anything else, picking up a Gelatin CC30G filter, or some equivalent, is going to be the essential first step. These are easily less than 10 bucks, and will work with any of the following combos. If you still want that movie film look without dealing with the hassles of ECN2 development, picking up a tungsten balanced roll of Cinestill film, like their popular Cinestill 800T, will get you 90% of the way there, while allowing you to get your film developed basically anywhere. Developing with the standard C41 process also has the side benefit of being a little more contrasty than ECN2, so you might not even have to do that much tweaking in post. You'll probably also want to pick up the 81 EF warming filter, but if you want to save a few bucks and you're doing almost any post color work on your pictures, you can probably get away without it, so long as you remember to add a little bit of warmth on the back end. If you're willing to deal with even more post editing or just want to cheap out, shooting simply with a cutout portion of a straw gel in front of the lens does give adequate results and is probably the easiest and most affordable filter to get a hold of. Almost any other color film, both professional and off the shelf, can be used for the same effect with some adjustments. As most color stills films are daylight balanced, be warned you're going to have to add quite a bit of blue back into the image to get you to that color balance of a tungsten film. Fortunately, this isn't too hard. Picking up a medium blue color correction filter, like an ADC filter, should add just enough blue back in to match a slightly warmed tungsten stock, at the admittedly hefty cost of nearly two stops of exposure once the green filter is factored in. On the digital front, things are a little bit different, however. This might be telling on myself a bit since I'm far from the best colorist, but I had a much harder time getting even raw digital photos to get even close to the look of my film photos using the same CC30G and 81EF combination. It always seemed to lean way too blue, which was extremely difficult to correct out while keeping the image looking at least somewhat natural. Your mileage may vary, of course, but I found, like the very first filter tests I was running, using the straw gel on digital almost always looked more natural, with far more predictable results. A few tweaks were still required though. I found that shooting at or grading to around 2650 Kelvin and cutting down the saturation helped give me an easier canvas to work with, but it was still very easy to get a surprisingly complete image with minimal grading. This extends to video as well, even the 8-bit footage coming out of my Sony a7 III came out looking great with only a little bit of contrast and a bit of blue color correction. So if you want to give this look a try, whether on film or digital, on stills or video, it's easily available to you without extensive editing or shelling out hundreds of dollars for big glass filters that I couldn't even find an easy way to rent. But even if you can do it, the question still remains. In this age of digital filmmaking, I think a lot of us have gotten afraid to commit to creative choices while shooting. One of the biggest things I see considered when people are choosing professional and prosumer cinema cameras these days are the exceptionally flat log profiles or even the capacity to shoot raw footage, even when there's no way they're ever going to be able to practically take advantage of either. Neither of these things are bad to have by any means, they're great tools to have when shooting video, but when I see people asking if they can get away with blurring in post instead of putting an actual diffusion filter on their lens, despite it almost always looking objectively worse, simply because they want the option to go either way, 
I feel like we're getting to a problematic level of decision paralysis. It's a common adage that some of the most interesting creative choices come from when you're limited in some way. Committing to an interesting look you might have to work around right from the get-go is a great way to start, and filters, especially color filters, are an excellent tool for that. No matter how easy it gets to color grade in post, there's something wholly unique about the look of a film shot from behind filters. Filter colors seem to contaminate every part of the palette, blending colors in organic ways that's hard to fully replicate through grading. It's not the only way to make a film look interesting. I made a whole 20-minute video about how even a single lens can impact the look of a film, but it's an element that I think doesn't get nearly enough attention. It's been over 20 years since The Ring's release, and we've come a long way since then. Digital grading has advanced to staggering levels, and color tools that cinematographers could only dream of before are free with a quick download of DaVinci Resolve. And with all that, it's easier than ever to play it safe. But what the legacy of the film shows is that you don't have to. Sometimes, the only way to do it right is to get it all in camera.